Okay, so let's start. Yes, we do have class on Tuesday, April 2nd. The test is online, but it will open at night. Okay, so let's, uh, so you, you see here, I have those slides just to summarize everything because electromagnetism, the math that we use in this class is not challenging. What is challenging is uh, other concept. So, so that's why I have done these uh, slides here. So again, when you have a charged particle and that charged particle is positive and it's moving, inside the magnetic field and the velocity has a component perpendicular to the magnetic field it's going to be deflected so in that case you see the magnetic field is in the screen in the screen okay and you use your three fingers and you go v b f so v is this way b is in the screen, so that's going to be the magnetic force. If the velocity is parallel to B, there is no force. If it's anti-parallel, there is no force. So velocity needs to have a component perpendicular to B. That's why you need to have a sign. Okay. So it's going to be V sine B times Q. Okay, so remember the magnetic force here, it's going to be QVB sine, or you can write it as QB V sine. So V sine is the Y component of the velocity, or the velocity that is perpendicular to B. Now, if you have a negative charge, it's going to be deflected, but in the opposite direction. So either for an electron, you take your left hand or you do like this without breaking your finger at the end. And then we talked about mass spectrometer and I made a mistake that mass spectrometer was developed actually by J.J. Thompson in 1913, mass spectrometer. So the way it works, you take isotope. So any biology lab or, or chemistry lab will have mass spectrometer. So you have a bunch of isotopes. So the same element, so the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. So they don't have the same mass. So the first thing you do, you ionize them. So for example, you strip them from one electron. So now they become positively charged, so one, uh, the, the charge will be um, the charge of a proton, okay? And then here you accelerate them through an electric field. So you see potential energy equals kinetic energy. So you have QU, U is the voltage that you apply. Remember, an electric field accelerates charged particles. So they will accelerate. So all that potential energy goes into kinetic energy. And then you use what is called a velocity selector. So you see here, the electric field is down. So the electric force will be down, but the magnetic force here, you see, wants to go this way. The magnetic field is in the screen. So the force will be up. So you have magnetic field up, electric field down so you have what it's called the velocity selector so you're going to select all the isotopes but you want to make sure that they have the same velocity so you isolate all the isotopes with the same velocity so when they enter here the magnetic field the the only thing that they don't have in common will be only the mass. All the isotopes will have the same mass, uh, no, sorry, the same velocity, the same charge. They will be in the same magnetic field. The only thing they don't have the same will be the mass. So you see the smaller isotope will curve 
more, so the radius will be smaller. You see the radius is proportional to the mass and the large isotope will curve less. So the, the radius will be larger. Okay, so you, there is an equation like that for the pop quiz. You see the radius is proportional to the mass. So this is called the mass spectrometer because if you have, for example, your detector, so you can move the detector or maybe you don't move your detector, you have the detector here and you're going to change the magnetic field until you can uh, detect a beam. So you, call, you can collect your isotopes and you can find the mass of the isotope because you have the radius. So you can use that for finding the masses of an isotope. You can use it to sort out isotopes. So I told you for uh, uranium, if you want to enrich uranium, back then, that's what they used, okay, to, to, to sort out uranium-235 from uranium-238, uranium-235, that's what you need for an atomic bomb. That was back then. Now they have different ways to do it. Or you can also count the abundance of each isotope. So here you can have a beep, 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 and beep, 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 beep. You know, so you, you know how many of them there is, how many, like, uh, I don't know, nickel, whatever is inside that uh, group of isotopes. Is that clear? So any lab, okay, will have a mass spectrometer. Okay, so we did that. And uh, that, that, that could be like, that, that will be a mass spectrometer. No, this, this device here will work on the same principle. So you're going to have an electric field here and you have a magnetic field there. And if you tune the magnetic field just the right way, the beam of electron will go in a straight line. And that's how JJ Thompson was able to discover the electron and to find the ratio between Q and M. Okay, you have the ratio here between Q and M. So that was done very early. Okay, and we did that uh, demo. I show you this demo here where you have, you accelerate the beam of electron and you deflect it using a uniform magnetic field. Okay, so here you see the electron is going this way. Okay, the magnetic field is going into the screen. So the, the force, if it was positive, is down. But because it's an electron, it's going to be this class. But today I cannot avoid. So uh, the class, uh, uh, the, the pop quiz starts at 3.25. Okay, so you have more time. You can talk to each other. You can ask me questions, but I will be in my meeting. So if you go discreetly on the side, if you want to not to be on the camera, you, you can still ask me questions. Okay, so 3.25 is the pop quiz for today. And I have a quiz. Uh, I have a meeting. Okay, so what happens if a charge, like a positive charge, okay, is not moving perpendicular to the magnetic field? It's not moving parallel to the magnetic field, but it's in moving in between. Okay, so it's, it, that means it makes an angle here. So that velocity will have two components, one which is perpendicular to the magnetic field and one which is parallel to the magnetic field. What, what do you think? Which one matters? The perpendicular one or the parallel one? Perpendicular one, right? So remember from physics one, motion along the x-axis is independent from motion along the y-axis or along the z-axis. So for example, for projectile motion, okay, it's doing two things at the same time. It's moving along the x-axis at a constant speed, but at the same time, it's accelerating down. So when you combine a straight line and here accelerated motion, you get a pa 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 ra 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 parabola. Okay. So here, same thing happens. If that particle is moving in this direction, so because of that component, it wants to circle out 
the magnetic field, but at the same time, it's moving in this direction and it wants to keep moving in that direction. To, don't take that away from me. So it's going to do that uh, uh, interesting motion. It's called um, helical. It's a helical motion. It's a helical path like this. Isn't that interesting? So for example, if you look at the Earth magnetic field, so the Earth magnetic field is protecting us from, uh, from uh, yes, uh, cosmic rays. So all those charged particles coming from the sun or coming from space can be very damaging for life. So now they're going to be forced to circle out on the magnetic field, right? Back and forth. Doing so, they're going to lose energy. And when a particle is accelerating, even though it's going into a circle, so it's you still have a centripetal acceleration, it's going to emit radiation. So any charged particles that are accelerating, it's going to emit radiation. That's why you have those uh, Van Allen belt okay, around the Earth. So all that will be beautiful colors that you can see in space. Okay, so that will be the motion I'm talking about. This is because the velocity has two components, one component perpendicular to B, so it will have to go around a circle, one component along B, so it's also moving forward. So it's doing two things at the same time. It's going around a circle, but also moving forward. And um, I don't know if, okay, I can show you, that's a, just an app, applet, no. Can you see here? So you see the charged particle is going around the magnetic field line. And why, uh, when it's doing this, it's gonna radiate electromagnetic waves, okay? It's gonna emit radiation. Isn't that interesting? Right? And uh, yeah, you have another picture for that. You have the velocity here. You have two components. Okay, so this component as the one I'm going to use to find the force. Okay, it's the perpendicular component that you use. So when you do F equals QBB, you use that component. Okay, that will be. Uh, the one used in your equation, this component does not matter and it's going to go around the magnetic field lines. Is that clear? Okay, isn't that interesting? So you, you, can, uh, you, you can have a lot of uh, interesting configuration. So for example, here you have two coils. So here the magnetic field is going to be very strong. Here, it's very weak because you see the, the lines are further away. Here, it's going to be strong enough, uh, strong again. So what the particle is going to go, it's going to circle out the magnetic field and then it's going to reverse. So you are trapping, you are trapping those charged particles inside a magnetic field. So that's why we use a magnetic field to store plasma. Okay, so when you have plasma, it's um, it's like the fourth phase of matter. Okay, you have a solid, a li a solid liquid, gas. Thank you, and then plasma. Plasma is that it's so hot that all electrons have been uh, free. Okay, so you have all charged particles, like like the sun. Around the sun, you have plasma. So this is called the magnetic uh, button because you can trap plasma and you can use that for all kinds of experiments. Example here, uh, this is called the tokamak. So a tokamak is like a big uh, donut. Here you have those coils, okay? So you have a magnetic field inside and those particles are gonna be trapped. Okay, so you are trapping these particles and uh, the idea behind it is that maybe we can make fusion happen. 
maybe we can fuse hydrogen into helium um, and solve the energy problem of the planet because that's what the sun is doing fusing hydrogen into helium it's going to produce a huge amount of energy without byproduct but um, they say we're going to do it but still not it's very hard actually it's very hard to be efficient okay so you see here electric fields here are very strong very strong weaker so the particle will be forced um will be trapped all around so it protects us okay it's like a shield okay And then you have something called the cyclotron. So if you go to the medical field, any big hospital will have a cyclotron. They use a cyclotron to make radio isotope. So these are isotopes with a short life. So they have to make them on the spot, okay? Because they have a short life, because they don't want to give someone a PET scan, for example. So if you want to have a PET scan, they need the cyclotron to make those radio isotopes. So you don't want to have someone you go going for a PET scan and then going outside and that person will be so radioactive that it's gonna <laughs> contaminate everyone. So they use a very short life radio isotope. So they have to do it on the spot. So that's why a PET scan is very expensive. It's not that um, there is risk and benefit, okay? I used to teach uh, medical uh, students pre-med, but you always have the idea of risk and benefit. So of course you have a risk when you are taking a PET scan because you're gonna be exposed to gamma rays. But at the same time, if you have something very uh, severe, um, you want to know what's going on, so you have a good resolution. So it's up to you to to do the balance, right? Is is it worth it, risk and and benefit? So anyway, why why do you use them? And I will, I, and then I will show you. So I'm just want to motivate you, and then I will show you how it works. So we need radio isotopes in hospitals uh, for PET scan. And also for um, cancer therapy. So, for example, for proton therapy, they shoot protons to to the tumor, and this is less damaging than a typical radiotherapy. But of course, you know it's expensive. Insurance don't want to cover, but it's it's less damaging. It's called proton therapy. So, how you do that? You need to make the proton here going into a circuit. So that will be done by what? What what is it that makes charged particle going into a circle? Huh? A what? A force. But what what are we using? What the unit is about? A magnetic field that will provide the centripetal force. So you need a magnetic field. So you need those huge coils. In addition to that, you want the proton to accelerate 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 so what do you need to accelerate a proton what is it that accelerate a proton an electric field only an electric field will accelerate a proton a magnetic field make it go around and you see here a spiral because the radius the radius will be proportional to the velocity Faster it goes, larger is the spiral. Does that make sense? So you're gonna speed up, go around, speed up, go around, speed up, go around, speed up, go around. And once it's uh, fast enough, it's ready for cancer therapy, like a proton therapy, or you can make radioisotopes. So how you do that? You shoot the proton like a projectile, for example, at a nitrogen molecule. And the byproduct here is carbon 11, which is radioactive. And very quickly, you have to be fast. Carbon 11 has a short life of 20 minutes. So it means in 20 minutes, half of it is gone. So you can use that. You can give it to a, a patient, for example. It will go, you, 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 you mix it with sugar. 
And you all know that cancer is a me metabolic uh, disease, so all it does to grow because of sugar. So if you stop the sugar, it's very good, actually. So anyway, you, you give it with sugar, the sugar will go to the tumor, and then you can you can detect where the tumor is because it's going to do beep, 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 because it's radioactive. So if you want to go to the brain, then you will use oxygen because the brain is an organ that you know that better than me, consume a lot of oxygen. High life is two minutes. If you want to check the thyroid here, uh, you will use um, uh, fluorine. Fluorine, is that, or iodine? Fluorine. So the thyroid likes iodine. Right, so you will use radioactive iodine. So I don't know why fluorine is used, but you are in the medical field, so you can figure this out. But that's the idea. Okay, we get to how a PET scan works. So I want to talk about the cyclotron, and that was developed just before World War II, and the person was uh, Ernest Lawrence, and it was developed at University of Berkeley. And uh, so here are how it works. Cyclotron, he got the Nobel Prize for it, okay? And then he used the technology to enrich uranium. But anyway, you see, between those uh, gaps, you apply a voltage. So let's review for the final. Each time you have a voltage, you're gonna have an electric field, okay? And it's AC, do you remember? AC voltage, plus, minus, plus, minus. So the proton here okay, is going to be um, deflected by the magnetic field. And between the gap, it's going to be accelerated by the electric field. And then it will be deflected by the magnetic field. And then it will be accelerated by the electric field. And then it will be deflected by the magnetic field. And then it will be very good, accelerated. And then it will be again deflected, accelerated, deflected, accelerated. So it's gonna go faster and faster and faster. This is genius. That's why the guy got the Nobel Prize. Because look, as, as it's gonna go faster and faster and faster, it's gonna make larger and larger circle, but it's confined. You don't need like a huge linear accelerator anymore like it was done. It doesn't take much space. It's, it's not very big. I can show you what it looks like. Looks like this, okay? It's, it's not very big. Isn't that star? Uh, uh, so, but each time it get to the gap here, the voltage, because it's AC, is going to switch. So the electric field is going to be in this direction. By the time it gets to here, so half a cycle after, it's going to be in the other direction. So the electric field is going to do this, okay? Because it's AC, so it's perfect. And why is so beautiful? Because look, I think there is another question about that. The time it takes for one cycle is velocity independent. It does not depend on the velocity. So even though here it's moving faster and faster and faster, it will always take the same time to complete half of a circle. So then you will know the frequency of the AC. Got that? Very important for uh, nuclear medicine. You know, I know they always need people uh, for, uh, for handling radioisotope. It's used to lo a lot in the hospitals, but not only. So here you see, it's uh, explained, you have a magnetic field, um, you can use a coil, you can even use a permanent magnet, and it's gonna accelerate, 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 going very fast, and then you can use your proton as a projectile. Okay, so if you go back to uh, proton therapy, we talk about it, that's, um, that's what they use. Okay? So why is it used for PET scan? Because look, you have a radioisotope, carbon 11. So it's gonna go to the tumor. Okay, you, you, you mix it with a sugar, tumor loves sugar, goes into the tumor here. And then because it's radioactive, it's gonna decay. 
and it's going to give you beta plus. So remember, scratch your head. What is a beta particle? So it's a negative, but what's the name of the particle? What is the elementary particle which is negative? Electron. That's a positron. It's a, it smells like an electron. It looks like an electron, but it's positive. So we call that a positron. So let me ask you something, scratch your head. If you have an electron and a positron, so that will be matter, antimatter. They, they go kaboom. Exactly, they annihilate each other. And when they annihilate each other, they're gonna burp out gamma rays. So what's happening inside you? God forbid there's a tumor here. Take that radioisotope, okay, positron is emitted, it's gonna combine with electron, boom. Gamma rays, boom, gamma rays, boom, gamma rays. So you are highlighted from the inside to outside. And because the gamma rays, like photons, are very small, you're going to have a very good resolution of what is inside. So it will be a better resolution than CAT scan. CAT scan is a better resolution, uh, resolution than MRI. But of course, MRI is less dangerous than the CAT scan, which is less dangerous than the PET scan. So I don't think you can have more than one PET scan a year. It's risk and benefit again, right? That's what they should teach for medical school, risk and benefit. So anyway, here is a very nice application. This is the Large Hadron Collider. It's uh, between Switzerland and France. It's deep in the ground, and they're going to do exactly this. They're going to accelerate with an electric field, deflect with the magnetic field. Accelerate, deflect. Accelerate, deflect. So you have two charges, right, colliding with each other, annihilating, destroying each other. Okay, they're going to smash to uh, together. So it's like a particle smasher destroying. And when you destroy mass, and it will crystallize again in new things, right? You're going to get pure energy. Out of the pure energy, you're going to discover new particles. And that's how they discovered in 2016, I think, the Higgs boson. Higgs boson is the god particle, Higgs boson. I don't want to get into details. I want to show you the physics, okay? You can look up god particle. Insignificant though this bottle of compressed Amanda. hydrogen gas yes. looks, right? it marks the beginning so of the I world's have... largest and most powerful particle accelerator chain, culminating in CERN's spectacular Large Hadron Collider. Hydrogen atoms from this gas cylinder are fed at a precisely controlled rate into the source chamber of a linear accelerator, CERN's LINAC-2, where their electrons are stripped off to leave hydrogen. Isn't that cool? They are being ionized, right? You learned that in chemistry. Let's see if we can go a little bit faster. If it's too fast, I would go back. Hydrogen nuclei. These are protons and have a positive charge, enabling them to be accelerated by an electric field. Their journey to eventually take part in ultra-high energy collisions, similar to those following the Big Bang, can now begin. This initial acceleration has caused Linux 2 to be likened to the lumbering first stage of a huge rocket. By the time this packet of protons leaves Linux 2, it'll be travelling at one-third the speed of light. It's about to enter the booster, stage two of the rocket, if you will. In order to maximize the intensity of the beam, the packet is divided up into four, one for each of the booster's rings. Straight acceleration is now impractical, and the booster is circular, 157 meters in circumference. In order to accelerate the packets, they are repeatedly circulated, and the electric field is now pulsed, in the same way that you push a child on a swing each time they reach a certain point. Magnets exert a force on the passing protons at right angles. So it's not really a magnet, okay? They are simplifying. Um, for the electric field, you're going to use an AC voltage. For the magnetic field, you're going to use a huge coal that costs a huge amount of money. Okay, we're talking about trillions of 
EV. Angles to their direction of motion. And so powerful electromagnets are used to bend the beam of protons round the circle. The booster accelerates the protons up to 91.6% of the speed of light and squeezes them closer together. Recombining the packet from the four rings, it's then flung on into the proton synchrotron, by analogy stage 3 of our rocket. Let's just follow two such proton packets. The proton synchrotron is 628 meters in circumference and they circulate for 1.2 seconds, reaching over 99.9% .9 of the velocity of light. It's here that the point of transition is reached, a point where the energy added to the protons by the pulsating electric field cannot translate into increased velocity as they're already approaching the limiting speed of light. Instead, the added energy manifests itself as increasing mass of the protons. In short, the protons can't go faster, so they get heavier. The microscopic kinetic energy of each proton is measured in units called electron volts, and now the energy of each proton has risen to 25 giga electron volts, or JEV. The protons are now 25 times heavier than they are at rest. The packets of protons are now channeled into stage 4, the superproton synchrotron, a huge ring 7 kilometers in circumference, designed specifically to accept protons at this energy and increase it to 450 jev. Soon, the packets of protons will be energized sufficiently to be launched into the orbit of the gigantic Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, which lies between the Jura Mountains and the Alps, and straddles both France and Switzerland. Lying deep underground, it has a circumference of 27 kilometers. There are two vacuum pipes within the LHC, containing proton beams traveling in opposite directions. Using ultra-sophisticated kickers to synchronize incoming packets with those already circulating, one vacuum pipe has injected into it protons which will circulate clockwise, and the other protons which will circulate anti-clockwise. The counter-rotating beams cross over in the four detector caverns, where they can be made to collide. The energy of the collision is double that of the individual opposing protons, and it's the debris from these collisions that is trapped in the detectors. For half an hour, the SPS injects protons. Finally, there are 2,808 packets. During this time, the LHC adds extra energy to each proton, whose velocity is now so near the speed of light that it goes round the 27-kilometer ring over 11,000 times each second, getting a boost of energy at each revolution from the pulsed electric field. Finally, each proton has an energy of 7 tera electron volts, and they're 7,000 times heavier than at rest. The magnetic force needed to keep the beams bending to the ring is so enormous that nearly 12,000 amps must flow through its electromagnets. This is achieved by making the LHC colder than outer space, so that its magnets become superconducting. Now the protons are ready to collide in the detectors. A steering magnet finally brings them into a collision course. The total energy of two protons colliding in the LHC is 14 tera electron volts and reproduces similar states to moments after the Big Bang. Particle tracks from these collisions will be analysed by computers connected to the detectors and it's hoped these tracks will give a new insight into the very birth of our universe. How our universe has evolved, what governs its behavior today, and where it's going in the future. Okay, so it led to a Nobel Prize, I think it was 2016, they discovered the Higgs boson. So, well, you remember Einstein equation says E equals mc squared. So that means mass is a form of energy. So when you destroy mass, because they collide with each other, you're going to have pure energy. And out of that energy, you're going to crystallize subparticles, so you can use stuff. And that's how they discover Higgs boson. Higgs boson is what uh, gives things mass. Okay, you, you can ask chat uh, GPT, it will explain to you. You do Higgs boson in simple terms. Okay, so you accelerate charged particle with an electric field and you bind particles with a magnetic field. So here they have to use 
a cause, but at a very low temperature to make sure that the current is going to be very strong. So it's supra, they are using supraconductor. Another famous application, I don't want to get into details because the physics is a little bit complex, but that's genius invention. Uh, that invention takes you back to World War II, and it was it, uh, the British made that invention. What, what did they invent, it, the British? You know how German, um, Germany, Nazi Germany wanted to invade England and then they gave up because each time they try to invade England, all of a sudden you have thousands or hundreds of pilots, English pilots ready, right? So how did they know? What is the device we use? Radar, very good, radar. They invented the radar. At the time, it was highly classified. So each time, um, German arrived with their airplanes, all of a sudden, you know, because of the radar, they knew that they were arriving. So what's a radar? It's a device that will send a microwave. Yes, it's a radiation, it's an electromagnetic wave. That electromagnetic wave will bounce off the airplane. So you know how fast uh, electromagnetic wave goes, that will be the speed of light how long it takes to echo back so you can find the distance. And it was highly classified. After the war, okay, they, they give the technology to the American. It was such an advanced technology that the scientists in America, they took a long time to figure it out. But once they figured it out, they, they found uh, an application for that, the microwave ovens, right? <laughs> so it's the they use the technology for the radar and shove it in, in a microwave oven. And that was a big breakthrough because every household in the US wanted to have a microwave oven. So the way it works, but in very simple terms, um, they use what it's called um, mag magnetron. It's called a magnetron. So how what do they use? It's the, the principle here is very easy. So you have electrons. So again, you're going to have a nanode and a cathode. So here you have the cathode and here you're going to have the anode. So you apply a voltage. Okay. So here the electrons, it's going to be so hot that it, they will break free from the cathode. And here they're going to accelerate because there is an electric field but you also apply a magnetic field. So not only they will accelerate between minus and plus, but they also bend. So doing so, because they accelerate, okay? So they accelerate because of the uh, electric field and also they have a centripetal acceleration. Anytime a charged particle accelerate, it will emit radiation. And what type of radiation is going to emit? Microwave. So you're going to produce microwave. Very smart. And then they added another step where they have those electrons keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and they can amplify the signal. So very, very smart technology. The frequency is always for microwave 2.4 gigahertz. Okay, you you don't need a strong magnet. So if you open your microwave, or don't do that, could be dangerous. But uh, anyway, inside the microwave, you just have a permanent magnet, not not that strong. So if you want, I will upload a, a movie, a video that will uh, explain how it works. If I if I don't, you can remind me. But it's a, it's a little bit. Um, World War II was one of the most dramatic. This radiation space, however, it's a huge huge difference in its pre-war has on pretty the time they. Okay, so the magnetic field forces the electrons to take a curved path. Since the path of the electrons is now curved, the time that the electrons spend in the interaction space is increased. The final structure thus formed is known as a Hull magnetron. So you see here, that will be the cathode. This is the anode. The electron will be bent because of the magnetic field. So they're gonna accelerate to the anode. When, the, when this is happening, the radiation here, microwave 
are emitted. Okay. If you are interested, I will upload the video. So that's a great application. You have another application here, interesting, it's called the Hall Effect. And this is used to measure magnetic field or to measure current. So I'll show you a simulation. So this is called the Hall Effect. Let's see. No, 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 not this one. I think there is a, a thing in the pop quiz about that. You see, you have the current flowing. The current is flowing. Do you remember, the current is moving positive charges, right? So it's moving towards you. Magnetic field is down, so the force will be to the right. So do you see how the protons will be moved to the right and the electron will be moved to the left? So on one side, you're going to have electrons here. On the other side, you have um, photons. So you're going to have a voltage here. Okay, so you're going to produce a voltage. That voltage, okay, will be proportional to B. So you can use that um, principle to measure the intensity of the magnetic field or the intensity of the current. Okay? So electric field, magnetic field, can we have a magnetic charge? Is that possible? Can we have a monopole? No monopole. It's always a dipole. Very good. Can we have a positive charge? Yes. A, ne a negative charge on its own? Yes. The electric field can diverge, converge, okay, when it's static but the magnetic field always curls around the current, right? Doesn't like to diverge, like, doesn't like to converge. This is because there is no monopole. For a magnetic force to be applied, it has to be a charge. The charge has to be moving and the velocity, at least a component of the velocity has to be perpendicular to B. Okay, so if it's moving with the magnetic field against the magnetic field, there is no force. An electric field will be always acting on the positive charge, negative charge. It's not being very picky. It doesn't care if it's moving or not, if the velocity is perpendicular or not. Okay. So that will be the summary. So the thing to remember is that the source for magnetism is moving charges. So even if you have a proton, for example, inside hydrogen atom, okay, it will have a spin. So everything happens like it's spinning. And so it will behave like a small magnet. Okay, and then I look at your equation sheet and I saw that some of the equations are missing. So what you want to do, okay, I will try to repeat it over and over again because I don't have everyone, but you see this page comes from your book, Johnson and Cantnell. You, you want to print them out unless you want to memorize everything. So that's good so if you want to train your memory but you want to print out this page and you can add that to your equation sheet. I will not do it for you, okay? I don't want to print out like 100 students. So you can print out this page. Is that clear? For, uh, uh, for test three, okay, it's gonna be online, but at least for the final. Is that clear? Yes. Okay, so for example, here you have a magnetic force acting on the moving charge and we want to make sure to use only the perpendicular component okay the, the component of the velocity perpendicular to b here you have the circular motion 
The radius is proportional to the mass, proportional to the velocity, inversely proportional to Q, inversely proportional to B. In the mass spectrometer, you're going to have this equation here. The V here is the potential difference, so it's the voltage. See, that's how we can find the mass of isotopes. That will be the force acting on a current, uh, a current carrying wire. Okay, you have this equation here, and that will be the torque applied on the loop of current inside the magnetic field. So, uh, this one, some people have still still have a hard time with that. But if you have a loop of current, a coil, a solenoid, you want to use those fingers. Those fingers uh, will represent the current, right? So fingers, that, that will be your coil here. So that will be the current. The thumb, the thumb will show you uh, the knob. Okay? So everything happens that this will behave like a bar magnet. This is the knob, and this is the sound. Okay, so if you have a magnetic field coming from north to south, you want to align with the magnetic field, okay, because north wants to go to south, so it will rotate. So it will be acted upon by a torque, and that will be the equation for the torque. Is that clear? So if you have a straight wire, current will be your thumb. And that will be the magnetic field circling around. If you have a coil, your fingers will be the current, and that will be your um, um, the magnetic that that will be your north current north. So that will be the magnetic field going this way. Okay, so that's to help you out. So we're gonna go back to the. So that chapter is called Ampere's Law. So again, the right hand, if you have current flowing to the right, the magnetic field wants to circle around. We already seen the, the principle, how it works. Now I want to do some math here. So you see, the magnetic field will be very strong when you are close to the wire, makes sense. And as you move away, it's going to decrease in magnitude. And you have an equation here, which is a very simple equation that will give you the magnitude of the magnetic field produced by a uh, current carrying wire, by a straight wire. Okay, You see, it's inversely proportional to the distance proportional to the current. And I'm introducing a new constant. You remember for uh, electrostatic, we had epsilon zero and K. So now we have a magnetic constant mu zero, okay? And mu zero will be four pi times 10 to the negative seven. And, and here you have the unit. So that will be the magnetic constant. Usually what I ask you is to have your equation sheet always close to you so you can look it up. You should have the magnetic constant on it. Okay, so again, this is the same thing here. You have a power supply, the current is flowing, the magnetic field will circle around and it does have a direction. So if you have a small uh, magnet, Okay, it will get, um, it will it will twist and it will align itself with the magnetic field lines. So it's going to go around this way. So you're going to have this equation here. So the magnetic field will be equals to. And if um, if you play with this equation, you're going to get this this equation here. 2 times 10 to the negative 7 IR because I'm substituting here. Let me show you. That's I'm just taking a shortcut. You see this equation here? B, the magnetic field, equals 
That's the magnetic constant. So four pi times 10 to the negative seven times the current, okay, divided by two pi and the distance from the wire. So you can cross out the pi. You simplify here two. So what you get at the end is two uh, times 10 to negative seven i over r. That will be for the magnitude. Is that clear? Huh, everyone? Okay. Okay, so you see it's very, it's inversely proportional to the distance. So at that distance here, it will be uh, twice as strong compared to this. Okay, multiply the distance by two, you divide by two. Okay, let's do some math because otherwise everyone is gonna go to sleep if I keep uh, talking. Okay, doing it. So you have a wire and somewhere you have a power supply, doesn't matter. So the magnetic field is going this way. Okay. The equation is, once you simplify, it's going to be 2 times 10 to the negative 7, the current divided by the distance. So that will be the magnetic field at the distance r. Okay? So... Why don't you get 2 times I just did that, so I erased it. Here, yeah. you simplify mu zero i over two pi, and mu zero equals to this. So you simplify and you get that. But you can you can keep this one. It doesn't matter. So r equals zero point zero one. The magnetic field is zero point three times ten to the negative three tesla. And the current is quotient mark. So, did you do it? Yes. So, your isolate I. You see, once you understand the concept, uh, math. The math is um, just algebra. So you get 15 amps. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay? Okay, number two. So it doesn't say where is north. I don't know where is north. So I'm going to say north is here. Okay, so, so the current is going north. So that will be north. So that means the magnetic field is circling in this direction. Oh, it's above. Well, it doesn't matter. And you want to find at a distance R. Okay, so the distance R uh, you are solving for B. Uh, six. 
So B equals, again, 2 times 10 to the negative 7. It's like a constant. This constant is like the 9 times 10 to the 9. No, what did I do? Why I repeat? No, uh, the equation is this. Okay, so what do you get? Just so. Which is 0 0.1 times 10 to the negative 4. So it's going to be a very weak magnetic field. It's 0 0.1 Gauss. And remember, the magnetic field of the Earth is 0 0.5 Gauss, so it's very small. But it's enough to deflect the compass like we did uh, the very first time of when we went over that unit. So, what's it? so if north is here, it's going to be this way. If north is there, you take your right hand. And it's going to go this way. I don't know. Uh, what is that? Counterclockwise. Okay. okay, let's do this one. So help each other. So double times ten to the negatives times I is so you take your uh, so if this is the west this is west. this is east so it's gonna go like this right in into the board it's gonna go this way. Okay, so that will be in the board, that will be toward you. Okay, you take your right hand. And now the equation is B equals 2 times 10 to the negative 7, the current and the radius. Uh, I don't know how much is that, but it's something. Eight times Tesla. Do you all, all agree? Okay, so that will be a point eight times ten to the negative four Tesla. So that's going to be zero point eight Gauss. Okay, so one gauss is 10 to the negative 4 tesla. Okay? Do, do you all, all agree with that? So you use your right hand. I don't know, let's, do you want to do number three or it's easy? Okay, let's do number three quickly so we can move on. Quick, 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 quick. 
So B equals two times ten to negative seven R. Okay. So B zero point two five times ten to negative three equals two times ten to negative seven times I divided by zero point two. Okay, so you cross multiply first. Okay, and then you divide by that. <laughs> Okay, so what you get? Yeah, it's it's a big value. Okay, so it's a big value. Okay, let's try to do this one. Come on, 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 come on. It's a two steps problem. It comes from the book Johnson and Kutner again. So two step. You have a wire. Okay. So it's gonna make a magnetic field. Okay, circling around. And then you place a positive charge that is moving in this direction. So you see the magnetic field is this way, the velocity is that way. So V and B and F. So the force is going in this direction. The force is always perpendicular to both the velocity and B. So the, the, what is going to happen? The charge will circle out around the wire. It, it's going to be bent, it will be deflected. So first step, you're going to find the magnetic field. Second step, you're going to use the, the magnetic force. They want you to find the magnetic force. Okay, go ahead, two step. First step, find the magnetic field. First step, you find the magnetic field. Okay, first step, you find the magnetic field. So you have the current, so I equals three. Huh? Let's see, you have the charge, 6.5 times 10 to the negative six Coulomb. You have the distance R, so distance R is 0 0.05 meters. You have the velocity, which is 280 meters per second. So step one, find B. Exactly, you are using the same expression. Okay. Yeah, what did you say? 1.2? Tesla, very good. Okay. So you have the magnetic field, which is 1.2 times 10 to negative 5. You have the velocity, which is 280 meter per second. So you have a force perpendicular to V, perpendicular to B. So that's when you get your uh, equation sheet. And you see that the magnetic force equals Q, B, and V 
perpendiculaire. V, perpendicular to B. O, Q, B, V, sign. Okay, and that will be one. This, this means the component that is perpendicular to B. So the force will be Q, V, B. The angle here is 90 degrees. So sine of 90 is zero. So you have the charge, you have the velocity, and oh, we have B. Okay? So what do you find? Uh, ah, we, uh, we used it here. So QVB, that will be the magnetic uh, force, right? Negative eight or negative seven? Negative eight, okay, I made a mistake. 10 to negative eight. Do you all agree? Okay, so you see you use the magnetic force and for B, you're gonna use uh, the equation for a magnetic field produced by the current I. Oh, they don't give you the solution, but I guess you write 2.18 times 10 to the negative eight. Okay, so interestingly, if you have two wires, Okay, so listen to that because that will be conceptual questions. Two wire and, and with current flowing through them, each wire will produce a magnetic field, right? So the magnetic field will interact with each other. The result of that will be that if the current flow in the same direction, the wire will attract each other if they flow in opposite direction, they will pale each other. So here they love each other because they are the same direction. Here they hate each other because they, they don't have the same political view. Okay, so they will pale each other. That's how you want to remember. And before going to the math, I just want to show you uh, uh, Forces. Um, if I find jumping wire, I cannot jumping jumping ring. No. Now, by the way, do you see the Van Allen here? I was looking at, do you see here? These are, these are the particles that are trapped inside the magnetic field of the earth, and it's gonna, it's gonna emit those beautiful colors. I just need to find the right uh, video. Stay with me. Don't, don't space out, I just have force. Jumping wire? No, it's not this one, right? I cannot find it. Okay. Watch, 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 watch. Watch. Amanda, are you watching? So you have a power supply. You have two wires. So it's in series. So because it's in series, it's going to be. Uh, so 
Do they like each other? Yes. If, if they flow in the opposite direction, do they like each other? No. Right? Um, that, that's why sometimes you walk by transformers, okay, and you hear those noise. That's because electricity flowing inside, you know, it's, it's going to make those wires vibrate. So what's the equation? The equation will be the following. The force per unit length, okay? The force per unit length will be equals to current one times current two times two times 10 to the negative seven divided by the distance between the wires. Okay, so you have this equation there. So you have the equation. Uh, the force between two wires per unit length, so the length of the wire, so you take two wire, okay, the length is L, and you have current flowing through them, so maybe you're going to have I1 here and I2. The distance between them is uh, G, for example, okay, so you're going to have the force per unit length will be equals to I1, I2. Here you have again that constant here, and here it will be the distance between them. So two wires, if the, the, the current flows in the same direction, the force will be, so for every action, you have an equal reaction. So the wires will attract each other. Okay, is that clear? So this is in Newton, meters, meters, amp, amp. Okay, let's see if we can find a... Okay, so this one is just conceptual. So you have current I1, and here you have current I2. Are, are those two... Uh, the, the loop here, is it attracted or repelled? So this, uh, this one and this one, this one and that one, do they attract or repel? They are in the same direction. They attract, okay, the same political view. So they attract each other. But this one and that one, they're gonna repel. But which one is stronger, the attraction or the, rep the repulsion? Attraction. So at the end, it's going to attract. Okay, so remember physics one, you, the, the, the sum, the sum of the four, when you add vectors. Okay, so this one will be attracted. This one will be, um, it's, it's, it's a repair. Okay, so that will be F1, that will be F2. So, but these are vectors, so F1 plus F2, it's going to be the sum, but the sum will be in, in this direction, right? Up will be stronger than down, so it will be attracted, yes? Up minus down. Okay, so now we're going to look here again, again again, 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 and again, uh, the loop of current, again, your fingers here is around the loop, your thumb, the thumb, pay attention because we have a pop quiz, and then I, I will be in, a, sadly, I will be in the meeting, so this is your loop here, right, so that will be your, um, no, 
and that will be your sound, right? That will be the magnetic dipole. So everything happens like you have a bar magnet, sound, no. Okay. And at the center of the loop, it's just an equation. At the center of the loop, you're going to have the magnetic field here will be given by this equation there at the center of the loop. Just another equation. So again, when you have a loop of current, you use your right hand. Okay. So you have the magnetic field going this way. Okay. So that will be the north side of your loop. And that will be the south side. North. You see the magnetic field goes from the north into the south. From the north into the south. So you have this uh, equation here, this one. Okay. So you have this equation here, B equals four pi times 10 to the negative seven, that will be your mu zero, I over two R. So what's the meaning is that if you have a loop of current, okay, so this is the loop of current, what's going to be the magnetic field here at the center? R is the radius. So make sure not to confuse with the previous equation. So it's not the same equation, right? Here we are finding the magnetic field at the center of the loop. Do you understand? Before we were talking about a straight wire, and we were finding the magnetic field at a distance r. Here you have a loop, the radius is r, and you are finding the magnetic field here at the center. So all that we already know. Okay, um, challenging, kind of challenging. What's gonna be the magnetic field here at C? So at the center here, you're going to use a second equation, and here you're going to use the first equation, but you have to use your hand. So the goal is to find the magnetic field here, okay? So from the straight wire, from the straight wire, B1, just in magnitude, okay? I'm just finding the magnitude, B1, it's going to be, what was the equation? Uh, 2 times 10 to the negative 7, is that right? From, from the wire, from the wire, this is R. So at that distance from the wire, at that distance from the wire, I'm going to use that equation B1, 2 times 10 to the negative 7, I, and that will be the distance here, so that will be R. Okay, do you agree with that? But now, can you can you trace B1 at point C? Is it going to be up or down? Okay, it's a little bit challenging. Bless you. Current I1 is going towards you, yes? Maybe we just turn more on like this. So I see it's gonna be well. This is current I1, right? The magnetic field is curling around, curling around. Ooh. So here the magnetic field will be uh, so I see the magnetic field produced by the strange wire will be up. Okay, look, look, this is I1. Circle, 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 oh, here. So it's gonna be up. At that point, it's gonna be this way. Right? Thank you. 
So that's going to be B1. What about B2? So B2, that will be the magnetic field from that loop. So you go, you go back to the slide. What's going to be the magnetic field at the center? It's going to be this, this expression here. Okay, you have a 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. So B2 will be 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. And you have I. And here you have 2I. This is I1 and this is I2. Two here. Do you agree? Okay, you go back the slide here. That will be the mag magnetic field at the center of the loop. Okay, so you have this equation there. So let me ask you something. Can you take again, again, the loop? So which way it's going gonna, it's gonna to circle? Where is your thumb? Down. down. The thumb is down. Because it's circling. Will you look at your thumb? Your thumb is down. Yeah, but why is it circling now? Because, because look at the direction. For I2? Yeah. I can so for a, a loop of current, you are using your finger, right? That's the loop. That's the magnetic field. If you are using a wire, the thumb is the wire, and your fingers are the magnetic field. Are the two magnetic fields always connected to each other? Well, it depends. If uh, if this one is being different, then the magnetic field is different. So they will be reinforcing each other. In that case, they are killing each other. So if you circle this way, magnetic field will be down. If you are circling that way, magnetic field will be up. Okay. So remember, if it's a straight wire, the thumb will be the current, magnetic field will circle around. If it is a loop, your fingers will be the current and your thumb will be the magnetic field. So that will be north, where the thumb is, and that will be south. Okay, so B2 is down. So, sorry, if, so if it's a loop, your thumb is the north, and then if it's a wire, your thumb is the No, if it's a wire, the thumb is the wire, is the current, and this is the magnetic field. Okay, so we need to, to compute them, and you see you will have to subtract them. So let's find the magnitude first. So B1 equals... 2 times 10 to the negative 7, I1 is 8, and the radius is 0 0.03. So you get negative 6 Tesla. B2 equals uh, if I simplify, it's going to be 2 pi times 10 to negative 7. The current is 2. This is 0 0.03. So that's going to be 4.2 times 10 to the negative 5. And this is negative 5 as well, right? This is negative 5. So which one is stronger? It's the B1. Okay, so B, B, the sum, 
will be up minus down. So B1 minus B2. Yeah. No, because I just simplify. But you can, because you do 4 pi times 10 to negative 7 i over 2 r, you can simplify. But, but you don't have to. Okay? So, remember that we have, we'll get back to that on Tuesday, but uh, remember that we have this, I have summarized everything here. You see, this is for a straight wire, and this is for a loop, 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 loop. Okay, so uh, we have to stop because I have a five to go.